This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecuritylc.com. The Secure Implementation Principles Level 100 presentation introduces the role that the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle fulfills in trusted application implementation and provides an overview of some of the common secure implementation issues addressed by the SDL, including buffer overflows, integer arithmetic errors, canonicalization issues, cross-site scripting issues, SQL injection issues, and cryptographic weaknesses. Addressing this subject matter will enable our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. Please note that this is a level 100 presentation meant to familiarize you with security implementation fundamentals and principles. These fundamentals and principles will be built upon in later SDL presentations. In this presentation, we will complete a high-level overview of the SDL, an overview of secure implementation, and an introduction of common secure implementation issues. We will also briefly look at how each of these issues is addressed by the SDL to help Microsoft better deliver safer and more trusted applications to its customers since the inception of the SDL in 2004. The Microsoft SDL is a holistic and comprehensive approach that leverages education, process, technology, and executive commitment to consistently create more secure software internally within and external of Microsoft. Since 2004, all internal Microsoft developers have been required to adhere to the SDL, and Microsoft has updated the SDL every six months to address any emerging threats since its inception. True to its name, the SDL was created to complement rather than disrupt the software development lifecycle. The core phases and principles of the SDL include the training phase, the requirements phase, the design phase, the implementation phase, the verification phase, the release phase, and finally the response phase. In the training phase, every Microsoft developer must complete mandatory security training focusing on secure application development practices. Training sessions include topics such as threat modeling, secure development and testing practices, and security for application development managers. In the requirement phase, requirements for security and privacy must accompany functional requirements of the software that's being created. Such requirements may include the use of encryption, authentication, and other security measures based on the business requirements exposure, and sensitive data. To that end, the security and privacy risk analysis is performed at this stage. In addition, the threshold for security and privacy, or bug bar, is defined during this phase to ensure that bugs with certain severity are addressed and resolved before the software is officially released. For the design phase, eradicating coding bugs with security implications is not sufficient. Design vulnerabilities can have a substantial detrimental impact on security and are much more difficult to address during the verification phase. To that end, threat modeling is a critical SDL requirement and a Microsoft security innovation that is recognized by analysts as the next evolution in creating more secure software. Through threat modeling, architects and developers at Microsoft are able to approach security in a structured and methodical way from an attacker's perspective. This allows Microsoft to identify and reduce attack surface and mitigate the risk of potential security design issues. The implementation phase is the application code development phase where code is written by developers using industry best practices and analyzed with both internal and external tools such as static code analyzers and special security debuggers to help ensure that those best practices are being followed. Requirements are also specified by the SDL in this phase to ensure that applications are built using the latest compiler versions and built-in compiler protection features. The verification phase is the quality assurance phase within which rigorous security testing is conducted in addition to typical functional testing procedures. In the release phase, the final security review is the major milestone that a Microsoft product team must pass in order to release a product under the SDL. During this meeting, 
Security experts and the development team review all of the activities, mitigations, and security artifacts that are relevant to the project in order to ensure that the security quality requirements are satisfied. During this phase, the product team defines a response plan describing procedures, accountabilities, and contact information in case security vulnerabilities are discovered after the product is optional, operational and used by the customers. In the response phase, after an application is released, the Microsoft Security Response Center, or MSRC, handles any security issues that are uncovered in the weld and mobilizes product teams within Microsoft to provide timely fixes for security issues. In summary, secure software development requires executive commitment, ongoing process improvement, education and training from VPs to product managers to developers to testers, tools to aid in detecting security vulnerabilities, and incentives and consequences to ensure everyone adheres to the SDL process. As was previously indicated, this presentation focuses on the secure implementation principles of the SDL. Specifically, this presentation focuses on principles and common issues related to the SDL implementation phase. Developers have the role of taking an application design and implementing it into functional code. Whenever certain secure implementation best practices are not followed, vulnerabilities in the application code implementation are created and can allow a malicious user to compromise an application and users. Secure implementation issues can be categorized broadly into two categories. The first category includes issues that stem from failing to validate input, and the second category is everything else. Trusting the state of input and using it in an application without proper validation is the root cause of many vulnerabilities. For example, buffer overflows, integer arithmetic errors, cross-site scripting issues, SQL injection, all of which will be discussed in this presentation, are all caused by some form of, of malicious input. Other secure implementation issues that do not stem from, from failing to sufficiently validate input include, but not limited to, issues such as improper access controls and improper use of, or weak cryptographic algorithms. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft which are incorporated in its SDL and more specifically in this presentation focusing on secure implementation principles are being shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. The best approach to input validation is to take the defensive approach and assume that all inputs contain malicious attack data until proven otherwise. At Microsoft, the motto amongst developers and secure implementation is all input is evil until proven otherwise with input validation. Any data that crosses the trust boundary and is used within an application you are developing should be validated. Examples of data that cross trust boundaries include data from users, such as malicious users or legitimate users, and even other systems, such as your competitor systems. Remember that any attack can originate from a human or a computer adversary. A good way to determine trust boundaries is through a technique used at Microsoft and mandated by the SDL called threat modeling. Threat modeling is the topic of another presentation, but briefly, threat modeling lets you decompose your application into separate components and lets you analyze the trust boundaries between separate components and the data flowing between them. Finally, when performing input validation, validate against expected data formats, lengths, types, and ranges. Do not look for specific attack data, which is called the blacklisting technique. Blacklisting requires that you know all possible attack patterns, which is extremely difficult to perform correctly. Rather, use the whitelisting approach, which compares input data against expected data format, lengths, types, and ranges. Any data that does not match the expected data pattern is considered malicious and should be safely rejected by the application. One of the best and most widely recognized examples of secure implementation issues that manifest whenever inputs are not validated or buffer overflows. A buffer overflow results when you allocate a fixed amount of memory and then write more data into that buffer than it can actually hold. Overflowing a buffer can modify sensitive in-memory constructs that can control execution flow. A malicious user can craft malicious inputs to overflow a buffer in such a way that the application executes the codes supplied by the malicious user or crashes the application to make it unavailable to other users.
Internet worms such as SQL Slammer and Zotob worm were examples of buffer overflow attacks. Buffer overflows are a big problem in certain programming languages, such as C and C++, and much less of a problem in managed languages like .NET and Java. However, you cannot assume that using a managed language provides immunity from buffer overflow attacks. The runtime environment itself is written in native code and may contain a buffer overflow that can be exploited via your code. This is not something that occurs often, but is still something to be aware of. More problematic are buffer overflows in unsafe managed code. For instance, calling into native code through interoperability services or using .NET code wrapped in unsafe blocks. These situations can definitely be dangerous and require lots of care. They are basically just as susceptible to buffer overflow attacks as a normal native application is. Finally, buffer overflows can occur on application stacks and heaps, which will be discussed next. The code shown here contains a buffer overflow on an application stack. It obtains 128 characters worth of memory, but does not check the length of the character string before writing it to that memory. On many computer architectures, this buffer of memory will be allocated on a stack with a return address to the calling function immediately following the arguments to the function. Therefore, after copying the string, the computer uses the address following the function arguments which can now be data supplied by a malicious user as the point from which to continue executing instructions. The malicious user merely writes data to, into this address to point to the rest of the malicious user's input, making the malicious user's code be what the computer executes when the function returns. The malicious user, in other words, now has complete control of the application. This is very bad. Buffer overflows can also occur on application heaps. Heap overflows work in a similar fashion as stack overflows, but instead of overriding execution flow control data on the stack, data used to manage the heap structure itself is overwritten. This can lead to a malicious user being able to control an application's execution flow. Heap overflows will not be discussed in more detail in this presentation. However, both are addressed by the SDL, which will be discussed later. The C and C++ end functions are often used by developers to control the length of data being written from one buffer to another. A common misconception amongst developers is that the use of these C and C++ end functions render an application immune from buffer overflows. This is incorrect. Here are several examples where the use of certain C and C++ end functions can still result in a buffer overflow. This example illustrates a common mistake using the C and C++ end functions, and that is using a constant, either from a header file or, as in this case, defined in the code, that is not the same as the actual size of the data type. The variable PSC source is a character pointer defined elsewhere. In this example, malloc creates a buffer size of 4. However, stir and copy copies at most 50 bytes into this 4-byte buffer, resulting in a potential buffer overflow condition. This example illustrates another common mistake using the C and C++ end functions. The function stir and copy does not null terminate the SC desk buffer because the source buffer is as long as the destination buffer. This behavior is defined in the C99 ISO IEC 9899 1999 specification. Since the buffer is not null terminated, it can cause unexpected application behavior and could also cause a subsequent buffer overflow condition if the buffer is copied into another buffer without restricting the size of that copy operation. The C and C++ end functions are useful to restrict the size of data being operated on. However, without extra care from developers, these functions can just as easily facilitate buffer overflow attacks as their non-end counterparts. The end functions require that developers have a deep understanding of the functions, which makes them uh, difficult to use correctly. Application development teams at Microsoft are prohibited from using the C and C++ end functions by the SDL and required to use safer alternatives such as the stir safe and safe CRT libraries.
How do you find and fix buffer overflow vulnerabilities? Here are some of the tools, techniques, and libraries developers can use to address the problem of buffer overflows as prescribed by the SDL. Reduce attack surface. This technique helps prevent buffer overflow attacks by reducing the possible application vectors that can be exploited by a malicious user. Search for risky functions. Reviewing your application code for weaknesses that could facilitate buffer overflow attacks before releasing it to customers can save you significant development costs fixing buffer overflows after release. Code review is not limited to buffer overflows only. It is also useful for identifying other types of secure implementation issues. Use safer libraries. Using safer libraries give developers less opportunity to make coding mistakes that could lead to buffer overflows. GS, NX, and heap checking. Current Microsoft compilers provide protection and features such as GS and heap checking that can detect certain buffer overruns during application runtime. These protection features give errors instead of allowing an exploit to run successfully. The Microsoft SDL requires that certain flags such as GS are enabled for all applications developed with the SDL. Prefast and Cell. Code scanning tools and source code marking techniques such as Microsoft Prefast and the source code annotation language or SAL featured in higher versions of Visual Studio can help detect vulnerabilities through static code analysis. Finally, fuzz testing. Fuzz tests can run in an automated fashion and find large number of vulnerabilities with very little, little engineering effort. This technique is introduced in the Secure Testing Principles presentation. Buffer overflows manifest whenever buffer data is not first validated before being used by applications. Similar conditions can be reproduced if developers are not careful when performing integer arithmetic. This category of coding error is known as integer arithmetic errors and can lead to vulnerabilities such as integer overflows, underflows, signed versus signed errors, and truncation. Please note that this example was adapted from the Microsoft Writing Secure Code 2nd Edition book. Here is an example of an integer arithmetic error that can lead to a stack-based buffer overflow condition. The code on the slide is a C language function called example that takes two arguments. The first is a character pointer argument called stir, which is the data to copy, and the second is an integer argument called size, which represents the size or length of stir. The code allocates a fixed buffer of 80 bytes and checks to ensure that the size of the intended source buffer, stir, is less than the size of the intended destination buffer, buff. If it is, then it assumes that it is safe to copy the data from stir into buff and proceeds with the call to stir copy. There is a significant problem with this code from a secure implementation perspective. The problem is that the code incorrectly assumes that the size argument will never be a negative value. Look at what happens if, for example, size is passed in as negative 10. The check done by the if statement will evaluate to true because negative 10, an integer, is less than size of buff, which returns 80. Technically, the function size of buff will return an unsigned integer, which most compilers will cast back to a signed integer because it is being compared with a signed integer. Stir copy then copies the data from stir into buff and if the length of stir exceeds the capacity of buff, then a buffer overflow condition will occur. Again, this is an example where a simple integer arithmetic error can lead to a buffer overflow condition. Fortunately, there are several actions developers can take to address the threat of attacks based on integer arithmetic errors. The first is to closely examine any calculation used to determine an array offset or memory location. Code review and code scanning tools can provide help in this effort. The second is to use unsigned variables for all array indexing and buffer sizes. Logically indexed data should not have negative indexes, and so the use of integers when indexing into arrays should be avoided. Lastly, code compilers can provide indication of possible integer arithmetic errors. The Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, for example, emits warning messages such as the following whenever it detects potential integer arithmetic errors in code. Data can be represented in many different forms, but still hold the same meaning. For instance, the word dog can be represented in French, 
English, and Japanese, and so on, but each of those translations has the same meaning. In application security, a canonicalization issue occurs whenever a security check is done on data that is represented in one form and then used by an application in another form. A few examples include data that is escaped, double escaped, or even triply escaped. Malicious users can often use canonicalization issues in code to bypass weak security checks, and in the next slide you will see an example of this. Here is an example of a common canonicalization issue and how a malicious user can use this issue to bypass security checks. On Windows file systems, these four names can all refer to the exact same file. secretfile.txt, secretfile.txt dot, secret tilde one dot text, secret file dot text colon colon dollar sign data. Here is some sample code that reads a file name from the user and grants access to the file only if the file name is not secret file dot text. Notice that it only looks for the file name secret file dot text and none of the other variants shown above. Because the code is only checking for one form of the file name, a malicious user could specify the same file using the second, third, or fourth representation of the file secretfile.txt and bypass the security check of this code. The only way to truly avoid this type of secure implementation issue is to understand what the final form of the data will be and make sure you are using that form when you perform your check. In other words, canonicalize the data into a standard form and then make a security decision based on that standard form. Another tip is to avoid making security decisions based on names altogether. Let the operating system do all the work for you and leverage built-in authorization and authentication systems. Finally, if you need to make name-based security decisions, then use regular expressions to restrict the type of data allowed in a valid name and validate data names in canonicalized forms with regular expressions and other security criteria. Cross-site scripting, or XSS, seems to be one of the most recurrent issues in web applications. In fact, according to the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are the number one web vulnerability today. Although it is a fairly simple issue to comprehend, it can be difficult for developers to prevent because of the multiple contexts in which information can be displayed in a web application. Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in a web application can lead to a compromise of the client using the application, such as the theft of cookies, and temporary web content modification. A web application can contain a cross-site scripting vulnerability if it reads input data into the application and does not validate that input data before echoing it as part of its response. Any input that comes from the client can be used to inject script in the application page such as text boxes, text areas, and even hidden fields and dropdowns. All parameters that are sent to the application through GET or POST requests can be modified using various web proxy tools to conduct this type of injection attack. Here is an example of how a malicious user can use a cross-site scripting vulnerability to steal the cookie of another user using a vulnerable web application. The vulnerable web application in this example takes input that is not validated and is echoed back in HTML response data. Note that the input can be controlled by a malicious user. In this case, the attack can be carried out by modifying the get request parameter in a URL, so a link can be provided that exploits the vulnerability, for example, by email. All it needs to be is clicked on. When the link is clicked on, the exploit inserts the attacker's own JavaScript into the document, which is executed in the same domain as a vulnerable website. The code has access to the user's cookie, and using a simple image tag, sends the attacker the user's cookie data and saves the data elsewhere on a server that they control. Our victim, Mary, clicks the link in her email inbox to claim her million dollar prize and unknowingly sends her cookie to the attacker. You can tell something is not quite right and you can see the URL encoded attack string in the address bar. A more clever attack string could execute the attack with little or no visible indication.
As with all the other security implementation issues discussed in this presentation thus far, the key technique to addressing this particular issue is to validate all inputs into a web application, including that which gets echoed back as web response data. This will help ensure that potential attack data cannot be echoed back in web responses and will reduce the likelihood that a cross-site scripting attack will su succeed. In addition to input validation, all input data that gets echoed back as part of web responses should also be encoded. What encoding does is it takes potentially executable web code or script and turns it into equivalent but non-executable forms. The Microsoft Developer Platform provides numerous encoding methods that can be used to provide protection from cross-site scripting attacks, such as those found in the .NET system.web.http utility class. The HTTP-only cookie option prevents access to cookie data via the document.cookie property from client-side script in Internet Explorer 6, Service Pack 1, and later. Internet Explorer 6 and later support a new security attribute for the frame and iframe elements. You can use the security attribute to apply the user-restricted site Internet Explorer security zone settings to an individual frame or iframe. By default, the restricted site's zone does not support script execution. Finally, ASP.NET provides some limited built-in protection against cross-site scripting attacks through the validate request page attribute. This feature will check all inputs to an ASP.NET page for certain cross-site scripting attacks and will throw a page exception if found. It is important to note that this feature provides only limited protection. Developers should still follow security development best practices, such as validating input and encoding web output that may contain untrusted input data. SQL injection, like cross-site scripting, is another common vulnerability that often plagues web-based applications. Like all the other security implementation issues discussed so far, SQL injection attacks are possible whenever input from an untrusted source is not validated and is inserted into strings that are later passed to a database engine for parsing and execution. SQL injection attacks allow malicious users to control the SQL commands executed by the database and allows them to do such things as modifying table data and execute commands from the database server. Let's look at a very simple example of a web application where a user can enter a shipping ID to track an online order. The user enters their tracking ID and behind the scenes, the following SQL query retrieves the appropriate shipping data. Let's see how a malicious user could potentially exploit this scenario. Above is the SQL query statement that is running behind the scenes. Let's look at different input scenarios, the resulting query that gets executed by the database engine and how failing to validate the input can lead to exploitable conditions. In the first scenario, input ID is set to 1000. The database simply executes select star from shipment orders where ID equals 1000 and retrieves the data for order corresponding to ID 1000 if it exists. This is the expected behavior that we want. Now, let's look at some more interesting ID inputs and see how they can be used by malicious users to perform unauthorized actions. In the second scenario, ID is specified by the malicious user as 1000, but some other data is also included. Notice here the malicious user is entering the shipment ID as 1000, quote, semicolon, drop table, shipment order, semicolon, dash, dash. When this gets inserted into the original select statement above, the database server actually sees two different SQL queries to execute. The first is to retrieve the information for the order corresponding to ID 1000, and the second is to drop the table labeled shipment orders. If this were a real life situation, then all the shipment data stored in the table would have been deleted. This is bad. In the third and last scenario, ID is specified by the malicious user as 1000 quote semicolon exec xp underscore command shell and then some command to execute. As with the second scenario, the database server sees two different SQL queries to execute. The first is to retrieve information for the order corresponding to ID 1000 and the second is to execute the xp command shell stored procedure and have it execute any command that the malicious user provides.
This is really, really bad. Please note that the double dashes is the equivalent of the comment character in programming languages like C Sharp, C, or C++. It indicates to the database engine that anything after the double dashes should be considered as a comment and not executed. In the attacks above, the additional single quote that the malicious user inserted would have imbalanced the number of quotes in the executing SQL query. The double dashes was used to comment out the final quote and semicolon that would have imbalanced the SQL query, caused a database error, and prevented the attack from succeeding. Here are several actions that developers can take to reduce the threat of SQL injection attacks. As with all the previously discussed secure implementation issues, all inputs should be validated for type, length, format, and range. The second approach is to use parameterized queries. In parameterized queries, input data is specifically labeled as parameter, which indicates to the executing database server that the input should be treated strictly as data and not as executable statements. In addition to input validation and parameterized queries, developers should also cons allow access to stored procedures using parameterized queries and not directly to the tables that those procedures operate on. This will limit the level of data access a malicious user can possibly have. Again, this portion of the presentation was meant to be an introduction to common secure implementation issues such as SQL injection. A more in-depth discussion on this particular issue is available. Often, applications need to store sensitive information such as passwords and user data. Cryptography, which is the process and the study of hiding secrets, is often used by developers to do this. However, using cryptography correctly can be difficult and when used incorrectly can leave sensitive application data at risk. Let's take a look at some common application development cryptographic mistakes. Some common cryptographic usage mistakes include incorrectly storing secrets inside applications and developers creating their own custom cryptographic algorithms. The first mistake is storing secrets inside an application. Application source code cannot defend itself, and so therefore secrets stored inside that source code is impossible to defend. A malicious user who can get access to the source code or to the memory of a machine that the application is running on or recently ran on will be able to easily retrieve the secret data. The second most common mistake is creating and using custom cryptographic algorithms. Standard cryptographic algorithms undergo several years of review and effectiveness testing by academic and industry experts before they even consider for standard approval. One can certainly create their own cryptographic algorithms, but those self-created algorithms would not have undergone the same rigorous testing and scrutiny that the standard algorithms will have. And in the absence of that rigorous industry expert review, it is extremely difficult to be assured of the robustness and safety of that algorithm. The Microsoft SDL requires that any application storing secrets such as keys, passwords, and other secret must do so using the Microsoft Data Protection API. The Data Protection API provides easy access to platform-provided cryptographic services and provides services useful for protecting application secret, such as key generation, integrity checking, and others. To address the common mistake of developers creating their own cryptographic algorithms, the SDL requires that application development teams only use approved cryptographic standard implemented on Windows platforms such as libraries found in the .NET framework namespace system.security.cryptography and native code libraries like Crypto API and Crypto API Next Generation. Even if a cryptographic algorithm has been approved as a standard, this does not necessarily mean that the algorithm is safe for use. Several algorithms since their approval as a standard have been shown to be weak or broken by researchers. Examples include MD5, used to hash data, and DES, used for symmetric data encryption. Both have been shown to be weak and have been deprecated for use by the industry and government. The Microsoft SDL provides guidelines as to the cryptographic algorithms that are no longer considered safe, and the appropriate replacements such as the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES, or sometimes referred to as Rindal. All new applications developed within Microsoft using the SDL must follow these guidelines.
This concludes the discussion on the SDL Secure Implementation Principles. In this presentation, we looked at an overview of the SDL and the important role it plays in the implementation stage of an application software development lifecycle. We discussed the importance of validating input and how failure to do so can lead to a majority of known application security issues, such as buffer overflows and SQL injection. We then briefly discussed some of the common secure implementation issues addressed by the SDL, which were buffer overflows, integer arithmetic errors, canonicalization issues, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and cryptographic weaknesses. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically, in this presentation which focused on secure implementation principles, have been shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecurityllc.com.